Hello and welcome to this week's podcast. This week uh, we're down to four. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Hello and welcome to this week's show. Yeah, I know. All right. I know. I know. <laughs> Amateur. Know, yeah, I know. It's rubbish. Uh, hello and welcome to this week's podcast. Hope you guys are well. This week we're down to just four of us, but it's a bit of an interesting mix this week because we've got a new guest. So there's me, Dave, and Darren, and we'd also like to introduce you to Mr. Nick Livesey. Hello, Nick. Hello, folks. Yeah. It's very thrilling to be with you this evening because, yeah. of course, I'm an avid viewer of the wonderful podcast, and um, I thought you'd never have me on. I was starting to get paranoid. Uh, we're, 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 we're really pleased to have you on, mate. We're really pleased. I should just say that um, Paul's not here because of family issues and COVID and etc. And Jamie's not here this week, unfortunately, either. And obviously, James is not here because he's sort of permanently not here at the moment. So uh, you're, you're with the four of us. So so I'm sure that literally everybody knows you, Nick. But um, just in case they don't, do you want to just like give a little tiny introduction to say who you are and where you work, where you're based and what you do? Well, can um, I, sorry, can I just interrupt? He sorry. always does that, always. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, no, when you say a little introduction... Oh, mate, I don't think a little introduction will do Nick justice. Well, Nick, I wasn't, I wasn't Nick, saying you little take, in terms of keep no, it quick. I was just saying no, like... Yeah, know. but I think because Nick's got such an interesting story. So, Mick, I'm going to put my feet up, mate. But, look, and you just take as long as you want to, to uh, tell us your story about yourself and Snowdonia. No pressure. Well, there's, not re- there's not a lot to tell, really. I live in Snowdonia. I take photos occasionally. Um, I'm a mountain leader. Um, alcoholic. That's about <laughs> it, really. Mate, there's a lot more than that. The way you, I mean, the, the video that you and you spoke about your love for the mountains and mountain healing, and and yeah, if people don't know, give us a bit of a flavour on that, mate. It's so interesting. Well, I'm trying to keep it light tonight. You know what I mean? Not trying to get too heavy and bore people with my bloviating. That's what we do every week. Yeah, so exactly, you should be fine. <laughs> I, I think the, th- the thing is, Nick, that let's be fair, you and I both meet lots of people who come to the mountains and say, oh, my God, you're so lucky that you live here. And I think your story is, is the best illustration I've ever come across of what I always tell people that, you know, we've got schools, we've got electricity, we've got sheep. You could move here. There's no excuse not to if you, if you want to. So, you know, you're the living proof of that. No, you're right. I mean, before I came here, I always thought that, because I'm from a council estate, I've never had any money. And I thought that to live in a little cottage somewhere or in Snowdonia, you had to be moneyed. But you don't. You've just got to really want it. A lot of people say, you know, I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. There's not really a great deal stopping them. But the trouble is, as with anything, it comes at a price. and You've got to really ask yourself what's important to you. Do you really want it more than anything else? If you do, then you'll find a way. Yeah. You'll just have to give up stuff like Tesco's around the corner yeah. or um, a house that isn't damp <laughs> or, or just eat or just eat. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> Sod that. I was tempted for a minute, but not going. This now. is the thing. Every Friday night, round about 7.30, as we're thinking about winding down, Gary's doorbell goes and, and it's yet another <laughs> humongous van full of calories. And... The thing is, like, me and the lovely Mrs. G thought last weekend, we'll have a curry. And there's a place in Langevny where I have to go and pick it up. But you can pay for it online, order it online. So it's quick and easy. That place has shut down. And now there's nowhere. I mean, tomorrow night we're going out for a curry. It's the first time we've actually gone out anywhere for a curry in three years and and so you know just getting your app out and going oh yeah pizza curry chicken wings mm. bucket of coke doesn't exist around here that's not a bad thing though mate that's not a bad thing at all i mean i must admit we haven't been out we're going out for a meal next sunday and that's the first time i think we've been to a restaurant probably for the last two years probably t- probably, probably 2019 was the last time we went out to a restaurant so this will be interesting. Well, I'm a bit Before gutted. The no, sorry, go on. No, I'm, I'm a bit gutted myself because we don't get all of Just Eat here. We only get, because I live in a little village just outside of Luton, so we only get the north end of Luton. 
in terms of food, and, and McDonald's isn't included in that. And they've just released the Chicken Big Mac. Move. A chicken, a chicken Big Mac. Well, I'm tempted. A Chicken Big Mac. Seriously. So I've got, to, I've got to actually physically get in the car and drive to go and get that, which is, you know, way too much exercise, really. But but you see, the lovely Mrs. G thinks that I'm really into walking in the mountains, but it's only because I can pop into Burger King in Bethesda on the way home. <laughs> oh, I didn't know there was one there. Yeah. I don't like Ooh. Burger King. But no, if I've been for a walk, I've kind of got an excuse, but I wouldn't otherwise. I don't make a special trip. Well, before COVID, right... This is no word of a lie. Every single night of the week, I would drive to a takeaway. Would Every you? single night, and I did it for years. I went, my favourite chip shop's in Porth Maddog. That's 40 minutes away. There's a nice kebab in Bliner. That's 30 minutes away. I go to Shan Gothlin for nice. a nice kebab wrap. That's like an hour and a half round trip. Wasn't there a place in Llan Roost as well that you mentioned? I, Tier Amor. That's a good chippy. Yeah. I used to go there a lot. But every night of the week, so when we started getting locked down, I was like, what am I going to eat? Yeah. So I had to learn how to cook. Banana bread, mate. Banana bread. It's the way forward, apparently. That's what everyone <laughs> ate, ate in lockdown. Is that chippy, the chippy you're on about, is that the one that's It's just outside? It's like, you've got, I can't, I can't, it's like, what was the place called? Oh, God. I can't remember the name of the place. I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, but it's like a little, little sort of like, like a small village outside of Port Maddock. Is that is that the one you're on about? No, it's it's right in Port Maddock. Oh, I think yeah. you're thinking of Tremadoc. Yes, yes. Which is Tremadoc. I was Chippy, hoping he was going to try. I was hoping he was going to try and pronounce Penryn Dihydrite or something. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, tr Tremadog. That was it. I remember Tremadog. Tremadog. <laughs> Tramadol. <laughs> Oh dear, it's very good there. Yeah, that, I, I would move for that chippy. That's a great chippy. Yeah, yeah I know them all. I yeah, know them all. Um, all ports in Llanberis is very, very good. The chicken is just oh, banging. Have you thought about being a takeaway leader as, as well as a mountain leader? You could sort of guide people around all the best fast food establishments in North Wales. It'd be, it'd be perfect. I, I would pay. Gal, you'd Definitely. be good at that. <laughs> yeah. There's got to be a book really in it. Good. Yeah. Let's have a chat after. Well, in my book, there's a big list of places to eat and that. So yeah. it's a big part of living around here, getting your fill. Mm, absolutely. Living and that, that is a great book. That is a, that is a fantastic book that you wrote, Nick. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate really that. Is, mate. I sure forgot did. to say I was an author, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what yeah. I told you. I said you should have spoke longer. You've got such an interesting story. No, I'd rather I'd rather respond to what you guys are saying rather than waffle on, you know. I'd be interested to know how much I've leached off you because I've got the Amazon link on my gear page right at the top. And I get a steady flow of Tuttons Apney a month in from that. And I, I'm willing to bet some of those are book sales. Is it one of those affiliate links? Yeah, yeah, things? of course it is. I don't do anything for free. I'm a total tart. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon you should give it in back, Dave. Well... <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I put some affiliate links on. This was quite a while ago. And I got a uh, an email from Amazon saying, look, you know, you, no one's clicked on your affiliate <laughs> links. Um, so we're going to settle your account and then we're going to close all your links down. And they sent me my, uh, my monthly income of... 18 pence um so yeah I, I did so that was worth the hour that it took me to to put all the affiliate links at 18 Mate, I, pence an hour i i got the same thing off of skillshare they sent me an email <laughs> saying you've been you've been advertising skillshare on your videos and you've had zero clicks yeah, you're, you're costing you're us money here. brother <laughs> mind you that said i mean you know the the few months that i did it was actually quite well paid so i don't care uh, oh well I was going yeah, to say with, with Thomas I remember we went to talk with Thomas Heaton and he said he did the because he, he was quite open about how he earned all his money and he said he, he earned a fair amount for affiliate links but most of it if I remember right I don't know if you were there Dave it was nappies yeah wasn't it there was what it was nappies so if you if you click on an affiliate link for the next 24 hours I think if you buy anything from Amazon the money goes to that affiliate link. Yeah, it does, and, yeah. And so, obviously, people are clicking on the links to look at the cameras or whatever, and then they come off and go, oh, must get some nappies. <laughs> well, yeah. well, that's, a, that's a strange substitute. Yeah. 
don't know why. No idea. But yeah, so there you go. Anyway, shall we shall we um shall we move on to a topic? You know, because uh, why not? Unless anyone wants to say what they've been doing this week. Has anyone been up to anything exciting this week? I have. Go on then. I went to the dentist for the first time in two years yesterday. Oh. Two years? Mm, two years. Yeah. Two years it's taken me. Well, no, I've had appointments and I had to cancel them at the last minute and then COVID kicked in and they cancelled me and all the rest of it. So, yeah, so yesterday was a, uh, a, a the hygienist and, and a checkup. And I knew I needed a, a crown, and that tooth got a bit worse. So there's a crown coming up uh, at the end of March, and and then an extraction at the back. And yeah, so it was bittersweet. I knew I needed to go, but then when you walk out of there, just thinking, Jesus Christ, there's a there's a nice lens there, you know, spending that kind of money. Sorry, Darren, which bit of that was sweet? I got all the bitter. <laughs> didn't catch well, any sweet bit well actually going you know actually going to the dentist i think right that's kind of done that's ticks off the list you know that's still not getting bit. the sweet no, still not no, getting no. the sweet mate sorry no, no. all right yeah. then all bitter it was yeah. bitter, bitter <laughs> yeah. definitely oh uh, anyone else been doing anything nick you done anything exciting this week um yes yesterday i went out for dinner at the local pub that was nice and i've been spending lot because i was really fed up with photography but i'm getting it back now and i've just been spending most of the days outside out the back of my house mm. which has been really nice and i've also started work again for the season so that's nice i'm back on snowden <laughs> i've seen some of your photos actually recently just just from the back of your house they're lovely that's it's a, a nice little yeah, area it is yeah beautiful, beautiful really yeah. nice Gotta say. never see anybody there nobody ever goes there no well, you haven't spotted me then stalking you <laughs> And say, don't advertise it too much in your videos. You'll have everyone come down on it. It's weird. So I'll, be, I'll be after them. So you say that you you had a bit of a lull in photography. You you sort of. Were, were I got to... completely fed up with it. Yeah. Yeah. A any reason or just? Well, I forget. I'm fed up with the whole thing. I'm fed up with f photographers. <laughs> and and having to well, see them for all joining the time. Us. <laughs> they bore me to death. <laughs> You know, it's always the same old crap. Do you know, I kind of and agree like, with you. I, 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 I do. I, the reason I asked you this is because I thought you might be heading this way. And I kind of agree with you. I do. It's like, why are we Why are we all doing it? It's almost like um, it's disappeared up its re own rectum, hasn't it? And, you know, none of the photographers are particularly interested in landscape. It's just like a big flipping willy-waving session, isn't it? It's like, uh, you know, war warfare... We we'll go to the same places, shoot the same locations, and try and outdo each other with increasingly psychedelic conditions. Yeah. And I just found it quite distasteful, really. So I just got into taking photographs of my mates on the hill, which I really enjoy. But lately, I've just turned a corner and I've thought, well, I don't have to do grand vistas. I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. I'm going to take some nice little photos outside the back of my house or wherever I go that means something to me and um, I don't really care what anybody else thinks anymore and that feels very very freeing it's liberating so I've got a much better relationship with it now I'm happy now oh, good good I've been I've been feeling the same but about vlogging I know so, I've heard yeah. you so yeah I've been like a couple of days ago so I just started to edit I've, I've got four videos that are sitting there that I need to edit if I'm going to get back to it and I just started to edit one and for some reason, because I deleted like loads and loads of, of photographers off of my YouTube subscription list, like lots. So I've got very few on there now. And I thought, I'll just have a look. So I typed in landscape photography and then put the filter onto this week. And there are hundreds and hundreds of videos. And they are all the same. They're yeah. all the same. It's just literally, if the titles aren't almost identical, just with different locations... The thumbnails are all identical, just with different locations. And all the people are just doing the same stuff. And it's the stuff that I've done all along as well. I'm not saying that it's, it's you know, stuff, oh, I'm much better than that. It's just all the same. And I just thought, oh, I'm, not sure I wanna, I'm not sure I want to do it, you know? All right, so let's talk about this then. I, I hear what you're saying, Nick. So why, do you, why is it you think that people are taking or they appear to take the same photo? Now, the way I'm looking at this is perhaps someone sees a photo, 
and they get inspired to go to a location. And perhaps that's why a lot of the photos are, are the same. Perhaps people are not, I don't know, but not, not try, trying to copy it, but perhaps it's that photo that's inspired them to, to, to go somewhere. And then that is almost like the, the, the image to take because that's the image that kind of presents itself. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. But it's diametrically opposed to why I got into photography in the first place, which was a, a bolt on to my hill walking. Yeah. It was an expression of my, you know, the, the first passion, which yeah. is being out there. Yeah. And I just think they've not got any imagination, which is absolutely fine. You don't have to have imagination. It's not a crime if you haven't. But my great joy is roaming around and chancing upon things. Yeah. So for you, the photography was a byproduct of actually being out in the mountains. It was, and of course, I got very unhealthy about it for a time, where you get to the point where you're going out, you're in amazing places, but you don't get any good shots, so you're really disappointed. And I thought, that's a bit perverted, really. It's the wrong way around. You know, because if, you're, if your pleasure depends on getting images in the outdoors, then you're going to spend most of your time disappointed. So did, did that, that feeling that you had, was that in the, would, the, would you say, the early days? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and also when, once I started to get a little bit of traction, you feel that compulsion to keep delivering, yeah. don't you? Yeah. And, you you know, you become a bit of a slave to it. Yeah. So because you, you've got to sort of ask yourself some questions, haven't you? I, I totally agree with you with that because I, I felt like that in, in the early days. You know, when I started moving over to landscape photography and then I'd kind of watch like YouTube videos and stuff and, and I just think, you know, or I, I, I'd see photos. I think, yeah, I really want to go to these places because I want to go there to get the photos. And you're right. And the conditions weren't right. And sometimes you're coming away feeling a little bit frustrated with yourself, frustrated with your photography. But then I think you kind of move past that and then you start to appreciate actually just being outside and then the photography almost comes second and that started to happen for me when I started visiting Snowdonia with Dave like about three years ago you know I'd, I'd come back and I just thought you know if I didn't get a photo it really wasn't the end of the world it was being out it was being outside so I think perhaps in the early days you do get that frustration but as you move on um it, you, you, can't, you know, you appreciate the outdoors and you just take take it or leave it with the photography. I think it's fair to say, though, as well, that a lot of the, open quotes, honeypot locations, particularly in this neck of the woods, are really easily accessible. And so people pitch up and it, there's no effort involved. It It's lazy. I mean, you know, let's be fair, that fucking tree at Clamberis, what's the point? I mean, you, 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 you're walking less than 20 metres from your car. And so w when you came up into the hills with me and we, we sort of roamed about a bit and, and you got to experience different conditions, mm. um, none of the images you came back with were honeypot images. And yet, by a country mile, they were far better than any number of, you know, pictures of Trevan from Avon Floyer. And things like that, or you know, uh, up at Comidwell or something like that. You know, that squall on the summit of Araran. I know that was incredible. days like that, that. Was, and yeah. and you just see almost no images. I mean, one of the reasons I spend a lot of time over at Ridley is because uh, it it caters very nicely for what whichever direction the light's coming from. There's always options. But when you get up onto the ridges around there, you know, if you slog up to a gun, um, which is pretty much a mile straight up, about 70 degrees. But when you get up there, the, the sort of 360 views you've got, you're looking down the coast, you've got the clean peninsula of peaks down at um, uh, Trevin and that sort of place. It, 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 it's, it's completely different. And I think that I can totally get Nick's point that it's all about being out and doing the walking and you get naturally rewarded when you carry a camera with you and you've got the skill set to take advantage of whatever nature presents to you and i think that people miss out they come to the mountains they've seen the honey pots oh i'll just emulate that and and it it's it's just 
barely scratching the surface of what the area has to offer. But I suppose on on you know on the flip side of that as well, and I'm not saying this is a good thing or a bad thing, but you know the the, the average person doesn't live in these amazing places, you know, like myself, you know. So you you have to you travel there on a Saturday, and you know you you come home on the Sunday for argument's sake. So you know if you if you didn't have like a real love affair with the mountains, you'd want to go somewhere that you that was almost like a a ready-made image there for you. Well, I, I don't necessarily buy that because what what we need really is is a book. I don't know something called, let's just say, photographing the Snowdonia Mountains. Do you know what I mean? Oh, <laughs> that's a good book. I'll oh, if only somebody one. wrote that. Yeah. No, but my my point is this, and and I think that I've got to put some wood on the fire before anyone moans at no, me. No, you I'm carry just on. We'll just talk off. amongst ourselves. But it, the 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 ability to research the area and not feel oh well i'm stuck with trying to find a parking space at Llyn Ogwin and take the tired old shots it's there for you you don't have to do that you could just take your camera with you and go for a walk because the mountains will present you with something most days if you're looking to progress and get better as a photographer you've got to start going out with without expectations you know, so you've, you've visited all these locations umpteen times. You've always used your a tripod. You've honed your compositional skills. After a year or two, you should be able to see and react. And I used to think that the only way to do it was to sit behind a tripod with this image you've visualised for years and wait for something to happen. Yeah. But it more or less hardly ever happens. I mean, let's be fair, by a country mile... Literally a country mile, one of the best photographic videos in Snowdonia ever was a slightly overweight bloke blubbing. Cheers, exactly. Oh. And and yeah. let's be fair, how few yeah. how few videos have you seen from there? You know, the pe people come and shoot the honeypots and yet this particular photographer was able to find something that stirred so much emotion in an area which is rarely featured on video or photo. That really spoke to me. Yeah, me too. I, and I, I watch it maybe once well. a year and I just thought this is the most genuine, heartfelt and brave video because you're emoting some expression, you know, some feeling, emotion there. That's what art should be. It's only because... I looked at those boathouses and thought you could get a Burger King in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you realised it was shut. made me emotional. <laughs> no. Well, what, well, thank you. That, that's I really. That, I mean, that's lovely. Lovely words from 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 all of you. But what what I was going to say was, we're going back to talking about like the photographers going to honeypot locations, and you were saying, Darren, that you think it's about inspiration. And I think in a lot of instances it is, but I also think in a, in in some instances they're like stamp collectors. Photographers yeah. are kind of like stamp collectors; they go and collect these. It's locations. photographic, photographic train spotting. Yeah, yeah. It's very acquisitive. Yeah, and the and the other the other reason I was going to say, which I think is on the rise, is they'll look at a photo on say Instagram and go, "Wow, that's got a lot of likes." And it's almost like collecting the likes as well. Like, I want to be popular, therefore I'll go and shoot a shot that's popular rather than I'll go my own way and do, like like you're saying, Nick, do the creative thing. Just go out for a day. I mean, when I go to Wales, I've got to admit that I usually go to places that I sort of know that I'm going to get a shot from. But on occasion, I'll just, like, for instance, I, I don't think there's that many at the top of... Oh, Say like get it all wrong again at the top of the uh, Nankwinan, yeah, at the very top, you know, where the road splits and you can one side you can go around to Clinogwin and the other side you can go down. There's not that many people who shoot up there, but I always looked up there and thought that's a really nice shot just because I used to just sometimes want to go drive around the area and see what's what. And I think that's that's kind of a, an important thing just to have a look around and just enjoy yourself really rather than stop here and you know stop at. The glitters and, you know, not the glitters, you know what I mean. But, but you've illustrated that beautifully. The whole thing of people who say, right, I'm going to go to Snowdonia, the lakes, Isle of Skye, wherever it may be. 
with a kind of checklist or must must get oh yeah well I've only got a limited amount of time but I know this is a good shot so I'll go there and I think they miss out so much on pitch up at the area park your car just accept you're not going to see it for 12 hours and go for a walk head off up a hill it doesn't matter you know get yourself a compass and a map and go explore because firstly you can you can certainly find loads of places where there won't be another person for miles around you know it's actually quite easy to get away from the crowds you'll have an amazing time and in the event that the light plays ball or you find something amazing to shoot great but if you don't you'll still have had a fantastic day out and stop trying to as Gary rightly says check off or the the Instagram shots because well, you, you'll get so much more out of it and you will feel less hard done by having made the effort to come to the area if you haven't got a honeypot list to tick off because if you come with no expectations then whatever the area throws at you whether it's horizontal rain because that's probably what you'll get um, you'll still have a good time and and you'll probably even if by Instagram standards you don't get as many likes it won't matter because you'll have some amazing memories and some fantastic well, normally when we do the pubcast, normally kind of every all of us are in agreement normally, apart from Gary. Uh, and Gary's the one that kind of causes the uh, con controversy. But I feel that I'm That's doing That's only because Bally's not here. <laughs> and, uh, so I agree with everything you're saying. Um, and I've never taken a photo for instagram likes or or anything i've or but i have gone to locations because i've seen the end product now i've done that so many times i've chosen to go to a location because i have seen a photo at the end of the hike but i can guarantee you this i have normally seen a lot better photos on the way to that end product but it's that end product it's that photo that's got me to go into that particular destination because I don't know Snowdonia. I mean, without you guys, but I don't know Snowdonia very well, you know, and I don't particularly know my way around the, the Lake District very well. So I, I do. I'm getting better now. But in the early days, it was that photo that got me to on that particular path. Does that kind of make sense? So I, I hear what you're saying, going off for a wander, but sometimes you can just go to a place especially like say like the lakes which is vast and you can just be a little bit overwhelmed thinking well wh where do I where do I go kind of thing but I think for me if I had a if I had a destination then I was happy then I'll go to that destination and honestly so many times I've got some fat cracking shots on the way but without seeing that I wouldn't have perhaps chosen that path I think the lakes though it for me is a whole different story because when you go to Snowdonia, there's loads of places to park. So you can just drive around. And no, but you can. You can just drive around in Snowdonia and just go, oh, there's a lay-by. You know, when I went by Barmouth that time and my camera broke, there was a just I just saw a lay-by with a load of trees up there and thought, I'm going to go and have a look up there. And you can do that in Snowdonia. But in the, yeah. in the Lake District, there's nowhere to park unless it's a, unless it's a National Trust car park. And generally kind of a national trust stick their car parks by the beauty spots by the spots that everyone's going to want to go and visit so it's difficult i think in the lake district unless you get like you say with dave you get out of your car and you walk for four hours not knowing where you're going but i don't know personally i i get my absolute <clears throat> most best moments from photography when i stumble across somewhere and go wow i, I, I didn't i didn't even know this was here you know, because oftentimes I've been to places that are honey, honeypot locations and been a bit disappointed because you've seen all the, like you say, you've seen all the photos of them and you're never going to get the best conditions or you're very rarely going to get the best conditions. So you're likely going to come back and go, oh, well, it was nice there, but it wasn't as good as some of the other shots I've seen there. But when you wander across somewhere, you're just wandering around like in a woodland or something and you go, like, like home fen is a classic example like you just get yourself lost in there and and you just you just see the compositions and and there's stuff that no one else has seen you can know it really well and still get yourself lost i understand 
Well, if you're Jamie. You do, if you go yeah. with Jamie, you do, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, have you, and on that subject, have you noticed that both Nick and I are far too polite to say, well, of course, if you're not from round here, you can always engage us to show you round. But we wouldn't say that, of course, and no doubt you'll edit that bit out. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll edit it out, and I won't put a little link at the bottom to your uh, to, to your services, either of you. I'd sure. just like to say, though, if you were thinking of moving on from this topic, that... As a society, we've got no, um, we want instant gratification, don't we? We've lost our attention spans. Yeah. Nobody seems to read books anymore. Before my first trip to the Lake District, I knew more about it than most of the photographers that are around at the moment. Because I'd read the Wainwright books from, I devoured it. Because the whole subject matter, you know, really, really fascinated me. Yeah. Don't seem to do that anymore. No, that's a good point. See, we I, don't invest ourselves I, in I the subject I tried to weed, to weed. I tried to read the Wainwright books. Um, and for me, they only come to life when I was there. So I, I tried right. to read them, but it wasn't doing it for me. But when I was, I, I would take one with me. And then when I was actually doing the hike and actually kind of referring to the book, it brought everything to life. I, I'm just that kind of learner. I'm, no, I'm then you much... make a really good point, Darren. My dad gave me his old library of, of books that he used to use as references for hiking in, in Snowdonia when he was, you know, we're talking the late 50s and early 60s here. And he said, here you go, here's a bunch of books. And I sat down and started reading them. And even knowing where they were, they were dry as a bone. It, it, it's it's yeah. only when you can when you're there and then you look at anything oh that's I, I don't, it brings it to life i am very much a, a hands-on learner i could read yeah. you know a, a, a book on a i could read a, a, a camera manual uh from cover to cover and i still want to understand it and give me five minutes with it in my hands and i'll start to understand it you know so um everybody's different but i do hear what you're saying nick and i think you're right and i think you know, I'm guilty of that. I'm not going to say that I'm not. I'm quite impatient. You know, I want to, not so much for the gratification, but, you know, if I think I want to go somewhere, I just want to I want to get there as quick as I can and, you know, try and explore it on the day. Perhaps I should take a step back and, and plan it a little bit better. If it works for you, there's no wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. I have got just better. Just work for me. I have got better as I've got, you know, as the last few years have gone by. You know, planning my routes and, and having a little look about. But, uh, are, are you guys off off subject a bit? Are you guys book readers, like fiction book? Do you read like fiction? You do not Dave. anymore. No. <clears throat> do you, Darren? I don't want to bring the tone down, but I've not read a book since I got tinnitus. Since I got really bad tinnitus about six years ago, I can't. I can't be in a quiet room and just reading because all I'm focusing on then is the tinnitus. So I, I listen to a lot of audio books now. So that's okay. really like, you know, my, my illness has brought the tone down, isn't it? No, no, you're fine. I hate <laughs> reading. I hate, I hate reading. I used to love reading. It's terrible. I don't, I don't mean to sound like, you know, but I just, I've, I think in my whole life, I've, I will read like um, non-fiction books like all day long. So I used to be, when I was a kid, I used to be fascinated with aeroplanes, like well, like US war, war planes and stuff like that. And I had book after book where I'd read about them. But you give me a fiction book, just no. I've read one fiction book, I think, in my entire life, and it was Star Wars The Return of the Jedi. And that was only because I'd seen the film. And it was the kid's version. And it had pictures in the middle. <laughs> That's the only reason I read it. Oh, I just don't, dear. I just don't, I just don't, I don't get, I just think, well, if I can watch it on telly, I don't have to worry about reading it. Just can just have it all in, you know, through my eyes. I don't have to worry about trying to work out what's going on in my head. Well, I did read a, a lot of Martina Cole's books and now I've got most of them on audio books. And if you've never listened to or read Martina Cole, well, for me anyway, because she's it's mainly like a, a London I mean, she's Irish, but it's more like the the old the, the London East End kind of scene back in the back in the sixties. I must admit, I don't. Right I don't street, believe it or not. I, I don't read everything. I consume is audio books these days because I can be doing something else at the same time. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I walked up through Camorthin the other week and I was listening to Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall. Brilliant. 
you know, a bit of heavy duty uh, Henry VIII and all that malarkey. Um, but I, I haven't got time to sit and read it. It's always when I'm doing something else. Well, I'll tell you what, the last book or audio book that I listened to, I only finished it last weekend. And it was, I'm not a big Stephen King fan at all. But I just thought, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna buy it. Salem's Lot, right? I think it was about twenty hours long. I listened to it all. Don't ask me what it's about. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> it was just background noise. In fact, I listened to the first hour and then I just thought, I didn't listen to any of that. So I rewound it all and then switched off again. I got up to that same point where I thought, I still don't know what's going on, but I'll catch up. But yeah, 16, 20 hours of that book. I ain't got I know it's about vampires see this is the point right that he did a, a mini series salem's lot back in the 80s with david soul right with one of the scariest scenes ever with the tapping on the window there's that one but there's yeah. also the one where that flipping blue-headed vampire the main man goes oh yeah <laughs> and i literally shat my pants as a young lad watching that right but the point is is you don't need to listen to the audio book because you can just watch that instead so, yeah, but the, that's the point, though, Gary. You have to sit and watch it. I, I, I as it happens, I'm a huge fan of Stephen King. Yeah, and I am. Is I, I, but I just love audio books. So every single day, I go for a walk around the lake out here. So that's forty five minutes, and I've always got an audio book on the go with that. If I'm in the hills, I've probably got an audio book on the go. Um, I can't work and listen to an audio book because no. I have to concentrate on my work. But um, I probably canter through about 20 hours a week, easy. I find myself going on to Audible and looking for books. Don't give a shit what they're about as long as they're 40-odd hours and I'm getting value for credit. Yeah. You know, it's any old rubbish as long as it's long. You see, the thing is, I'm, I'm a bit like Darren. I can't focus... On, on listening to if, if I'm walking, oh no I, I can fo no, no I can focus on audio books yeah. it's just this one particular that one, one yeah. that it just it just I don't know if it was just I don't know if it was just the author Stephen King or the way it was narrated I'm not too sure but I I just kept constantly drifting away where normally I, I love audio books for the same reason as Dave because obviously I do a manual job I'm not constantly having to concentrate you know like dave does on a computer i'm working away and i'm pretty much on autopilot listening to the audio books yeah they're I'm fantastic shockingly, i'm shockingly bad like literally if i pick up a beer and start to drink it i've lost focus on what you're saying so anything you said <laughs> while i'm having a beer i'm gonna have to listen to back in the edit otherwise i'm just going to be lost you could you could literally say anything if i have to put one foot in front of the other then i can't concentrate on listening and the other thing i find i do all the time is if I'm sat on my iPhone like this and I'll read something and let's say, for instance, it says, I don't know, um, something to do with a football transfer. So-and-so's joined Man United. And my my daughter or my wife will say to me something and I'll go, mm, yeah, Man United. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go, I'm sorry, I don't know why I said that. I just read it. I have no idea. So I, yeah, te so. I tell you, just completely as an aside, what I have as background white noise while I'm working on YouTube is it's court cases from the USA where they show the whole case. So, so you get, you know, somebody who shot up a waffle house and shot four people <laughs> and is claiming he's, he was insane at the time. And you get two weeks of prosecution, defense, you know, the whole nine yards. So you, you're, the, you're a fly on the wall for the entire case. It's brilliant background rubbish because you can zone in and out of it. And then I find myself going, oh, yeah, if I was on the jury, he, he obviously did it. Um, and then the, the worst thing is when your missus knows you're following a case and she sends you a bloody Facebook message saying, oh, he got, he was guilty. And he, oh, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> oh, no, if I want background noise, I'll just put previous episodes of the podcast on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's something to go to sleep to. That's exactly. For, that's for insomnia. I tell you what, then let's talk about something else. Let's move on. We've, we're still going through the, the list of questions uh, from uh, you guys on Facebook, which I've got to say is fantastic. You know, still got loads and loads to go through. But basically, we've had a couple here that are very similar. So the first one is from Jeff Heron, 
and he says what what would you consider a landscape image to be uh, or sorry would you consider a landscape image to be a grand vista or an intimate shot part of the scene or both and then he goes on a little bit more and then there was also uh, a question from simon byrne which says what defines a landscape photo what is a landscape photo can it have people in it or buildings when does it when does a landscape photo become a travel photo and he goes on a bit more as well so i mean this is kind of an interesting one um this could take forever or it could take two minutes to answer this question um I don't know. I mean, I don't know if any of you guys have got particular particular input on it. But I suppose you could call a travel photo a photo from anybody who's a tourist and who doesn't live in the local area. That would be a travel photo, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, my personal view on it is, is a photo is just a photo. It, it doesn't... I don't think you can put it in a box. I well, I mean, you can do, but it's a bit, it's a bit of a... Pointless exercise, isn't it? Well, with the travel photo, Gary, what we can do, we can find a brown person with a really wrinkled face and take a photo of that and think it imparts some kind of great sort of philosophical point. That's very true. I, that, I mean, or it could just be a photo. Yeah. And that, that's they, kind of my... they tend to do well in camera club competitions. Though, oh, my God. If you get, if you get a, a characterful face, honestly, or... or and, and the thing is, as well, in camera club competitions, not meaning to moan about camera club competitions, but if you put in that it's been taken in India or the Philippines or wherever, even if it's been taken on Camden High Street, you'll do better for it as well. Oh, you've been to India. Well done. Well, I'll tell you what, I reckon in a few years... I reckon I'll be one of them photos, gal, that you would like to take. Cause <laughs> when, I, when I go like that, I, 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 the wrinkles that I've got and the lines here... Hang on, hang on, don't move. Look at, look at that, look. Don't, don't, look, is it, don't. See that? You're, you're, you'll win first prize, look at that. <laughs> don't, use that the, a, don't use that as a thumbnail, will you? Jesus. <laughs> turn the clarity down a bit, that'll smooth him out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll tell you what, what someone said about... Um, you know, can a landscape photo have a, a have a building in it or a person? Now, when I first started, I didn't want either of those in my landscape photos. And I was in Iceland once with um, a, a friend of mine, and neither of us, we were both very kind of new to, to landscape photography. And um, I was taking a, a photo of, of Vestraholm, uh, and there was a, a person down on the on the black sand uh, and I actually and he had a I think it was like a blue coat on and wrinkly face actually, a what wrinkly face I couldn't see the face mate oh, okay. no I couldn't see the face sorry and um I actually waited for him to kind of walk out of the shot um and my my friend Neil took the same photo well roughly as me uh, with him in and his photo was so much better because that person was in it and I also think with now buildings as well. So if I can get a shot with a building in it, I'm more than happy to do that. I just, I just think it adds something. I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes I think that adds something to it. And I'm more than happy now to take a, a photo with a person or a building in it. But don't you, don't you feel, though, that it, 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 it shouldn't matter? Why do, this is the thing that gets me when, like, it's, whenever I used to go on landscape for, or photography forums... People always seem to want to put things into boxes. They want to say, this is a landscape shot, and this is a street shot, and this is this, and this is the camera you should use, and this is the camera you shouldn't use, and this is the lens you should... What? Just take a photo. Take the picture and, and enjoy it. Don't worry. Like I would never go anywhere and go, I can't call that a landscape photo because it's got building in it. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's, just a, it's a photo. I mean, the thing about it is, and you're absolutely right, Gary, let's be fair. If you, for example, took a picture of a chip shot with a row of seagulls on the top and you described that in any context as a landscape photograph, or if you took a picture of, of a wall with geometric blocks of colour and you said this is a landscape, people would laugh at you. And yet... Both of those did rather well in last year's Landscape Photographer of the Year competition. So mm. it, 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 Nick's absolutely right. It makes no sense. It, it, it's, you know, you just point your camera at what you like and enjoy it. 
and move on. I find though this is around photography in general, not just what you take, but how you should take it, what you should do. Like I did, a, I did a thing uh, in the last lockdown, and uh, someone there, there seems to be like a a little bit of a click about how you take a photo. It's got to be in manual. It's got to be on a tripod. It's got to be X. You know, you got to do. It's got to be ISO one hundred. It's got to be f eleven. It's got to be the sharpest point on you. Know. For me. The only thing that matters about a photo is the end product, the, the photo. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter if you took it standing on your head naked. As long as the photo looks good, <clears throat> it doesn't... Well, yeah, I know. Well, obviously, for decency of the people around you. But no, but as long as the photo looks good, as long as it's what you wanted to get, it doesn't matter about how you took it, what camera you took it on, whether it's a landscape shot or a, or a, or a architecture shot or a people shot or a travel shot. It doesn't matter. And people get so hung up over these things. They get so hung up over what, almost like convention, what we should be doing, what we should be listening <clears> to, what we should be watching, what we should be taking. What we should just do it for yourself. Do what you want and enjoy it. Don't worry about it. Do, don't, like again, doing it for the likes. Or let's all do it because it, you know, go to a honeypot location because it's got X number of likes. It doesn't matter if if you like if you take a shot of a pure white scene, and everyone else goes. Well, that does nothing for me at all. But you go, well, do you know what? I know what I was taking and I really enjoyed it. It's all that matters, surely. I've, I spoke about this on the podcast before. One of my favourite photos was taken in Iceland and it means nothing to anybody apart from me. And there was a storm coming in, like a real severe storm. Like, you know, the part of Iceland I was in was going on to lockdown. We had to get out pretty We had to be back in the hotel by midday because the storm was coming. And it's this, it's just literally, I've got a horizontal line. I've got the horizon and everything below the horizon was just white snow and everything above the horizon was just this black cloud that it just filled up the, you know, the whole picture. So it really was just a block of really dark grey and a block of really bright white for the snow. And if, you, if I showed that to anyone else, they wouldn't think anything of it. But I suppose because I was there and I knew what that photo meant, I love that photo. I think that's what that's what I think that's what we all say. That's what photography is about, isn't it? Exactly. It's ca- it's I, I'm off to take that. a picture of myself, a <laughs> selfie, hanging upside down in, with no clothes on. <laughs> I think that would be quite good for my next thumbnail. Trouble is, you'll cover the viewfinder. <laughs> <laughs> Third leg days. Uh, well, there you go. I mean, I think we've I think we've answered that question by just saying, <clears throat> does it really matter? I think that's probably fair, isn't it? D- does it really matter? <sighs> anyway, I tell you what. I tell you what. I, th- I think we finished that topic. So, I've got I've got a question, right? I've got a question for you guys, and I kind of threw this on you. I know Darren, you're you're not particularly looking forward to this one. I threw it on you first off, right? But adverts, right? I want to talk about adverts you love from the past and present and adverts you hate right and i'm going to start because there's an advert that... can i just no sorry go on <laughs> go on sorry no that was sorry no. i've just got to the age right where if i don't say something when i think of it within oh, yeah. 10 seconds it just goes go on then i'll right. tell you what if we had a quid for every time darren started the sentence <laughs> with can i just <laughs> sorry i know right look because i'm gonna forget let me get this out talking of adverts has anyone ever taken any notice of a YouTube advert or do you just wait for that five seconds and press skip? I've got a Skillshare website. <laughs> I, 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 I've got a Squarespace website. Uh, uh, no. I, honestly, I don't know. I don't know why unless I don't know. I've never taken any notice of any adverts on a YouTube video. I tell you what, the best money I ever spent was a YouTube premium membership where you get no adverts. Because I watch a lot of YouTube, not photography, I must admit, but no adverts. Brilliant. Uh, that's, that's worth, I, I've no idea, I'm, it's 11 quid a month or something. I mean, it's nothing, is it, to, to not be bugged by adverts. 11 quid? I can't even afford the heating bill. Not, uh, that's get out of there. <laughs> it's ridiculous. There's an advert actually on YouTube which we can add to adverts I hate. There's an advert for, I think it's called Artlist IO. Haven't yeah? seen it, right? And it's, it's, this is a few years. It's a few years back, or maybe about a year back. And there's a woman on it goes, want to get the best food in the year? 
and I'm like, I can't, like, her voice comes on and I just switch off the whole video. I'm like, I can't, I cannot even watch five seconds of her. She just annoys the crap out of me. When to get the best. Oh, something like that. It's very, it's very, very annoying. Oh, it's got to be worth 11 quid not to have to watch that. Definitely. Do you know what? I actually, I actually somewhere, <laughs> somewhere back in the day, I actually screenshot, like, screen recorded it. For a reason, and I can't. I think I was going to do a rant about why I hate adverts at the beginning, and I couldn't even watch that to do the edit, so I just deleted it. Want to get the best <laughs> name for you? <laughs> like, seriously, I just want to kill her. I can't stand it. Anyway, right. So adverts, right. Moving on, adverts. And no, Darren, I don't watch any of them through. And actually, when the guy says, you know, when you get those ones where he says, "Wait, don't skip, don't skip," this I just go skip. Definitely, skip. yeah. I'm I'm hovering at yeah, that point. Skip. Yeah. Adverts, right? This is this has been they've been bugging me for about four years, right? Purple bricks, right? When purple bricks very first started, yeah, they had these two guys come on and say, When we founded Purple Bricks, we wanted to do this and change the way state agents work, and then the next advert was them going, When we founded Purple Bricks, right? And I genuinely thought, and I think I think that they should be, I genuinely thought that they were the founders of Purple Bricks. And then one of the bastards turned up on another advert. <laughs> and that wound me. Honestly, I was like, you asked my wife. She's like, I still do it now. She's like, shut up, Gary, just leave it. But I'm like, I can't I can't stand the fact that these guys, they make out, they work, they... And I know people, you know, when you get like adverts for whatever and, and you get actors in there and they're making out that they do. But these guys said they founded Purple Bricks. They said they said they and they didn't. And that, nothing's wound me up more than that. Did Steve Wright in the afternoon base his Mr. Angry character on you, do you reckon? Because <laughs> everything winds you up. <laughs> yeah, lots of things wind me up. But that really, that really winds me up. Like, and there's another one. For Hatter's Fine Furnishings of Bedford. You probably don't get it where you are. Right? No, Hatter's Fine Furnishings of Bedford, right? It's got this manager guy and it says manager on his thing and he's wandering around and he's like, you know, talking to the staff and they come out the front and they're all stood out the front to have their, like, you know, photo taken and he's there as a the manager. Next week he's selling fucking gold. Another lying bastard. I can't, it just bugs me. It's just like, if why can't they just get the proper owners of Purple Bricks unless they're grotesquely ugly? But these guys weren't exactly good looking, which made me think they were the owners. It wasn't like Brad Pitt and Ryan Reynolds coming out going, oh, I own Purple Bricks. It was like me and, I don't know, Paul. So. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I thought. They were real. You know, you know that's going to get dubbed over. <laughs> That'll get bleeped. Mark yeah, my words. Yeah, I have to, unfortunately, because, you know, we don't get on the best. Um, anyway, so, yeah, that really annoyed me. Are there any adverts uh, that you uh, that you love or that annoy you? Because it's a short segment, if there aren't, really. Go on, Nick. Adverts were brilliant in the 80s, weren't they? They were brilliant. Shake and vac. Kiora. Classic. Oh, Kiora, I forgot about Kiora. You remember that one? I'll be your dog. Yeah, yeah, that was a great advert. And um, one that I really loved that I've only just remembered is the Castrol GTX ones. Oh, with, with it going around the, all yeah. the pipe work? Yeah. And that yeah. kind of sombre music, yeah. really atmospheric. Yeah. Um, but better than the adverts were the public information films. You know, protect and survive and oh, stuff yeah, like that. That's scary. And Char P Petunia. Charlie says. <laughs> Charlie says, yeah. Do, do you know what Charlie says? I, tr I the prodigy did it. Uh, Charlie says, didn't they? Do you remember they did a song, and that came on the other day, and my daughter was watching it, and I was trying to explain to her what the cat and the boy were. I was trying to say they were pub like you say, well, you know, Charlie says never go off with strangers, and she sort of looked at me like You're taking a piss. <laughs> they, re they really did that. It was a different world back then. Oh, it was. I know we spoke oh, about a year ago, and I remember saying that I just don't watch hardly any real TV. All my viewing is is pretty much like YouTube and or, or catch up TV. But I don't know what it is. Just over the last kind of four or five months, I have been getting quite involved actually with Netflix. Okay. And there was there were some great programs. Yeah. On Netflix, 
Um, just just things that I wouldn't have, have normally kind of sat down to watch. But I think, you know, me and Els, we kind of get in from work and then we'll perhaps have an hour together in the in the kitchen watching uh, a, a, an episode or something and stay close. That Have you seen that? Stay close. Oh, well, it's not... That is that is really good. Oh, it's a programme. It's not what you get up to in the kitchen. No, 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 no. No, yeah, that is a really good... That's Netflix state. and chill, Dave. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a different thing. I'm yeah. from the 80s. I've come yeah. forward in time. I'm, think of me as, as a cat weasel. <laughs> cat weasel. Cat weasel was good. I like the cat weasel. No, stay close. I'd recommend that. That is really... Have you seen The Witcher? No. Well, we see you're missing out, mate. The wish is pretty good. But we watch a lot of Netflix, but it's all documentaries. We're watching things like Puppet Master, where a bloke kind of, you know, gaslights a woman and all this sort of thing, because the lovely Mrs. G reckons she's a victim of that sort of thing. Oh. I definitely get gaslighted. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> oh, no, you're right. I was, yeah, sorry, I was totally, I was totally wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, we're going nowhere this week. Oh, that's great. I'm loving it. It's entertaining anyway. Oh, anyway, what, what are we going to talk about? Should we find some else? Well, I'll tell you, I've got a, a subject we can perhaps... It's quite a broad topic, but it can okay. be anything. Yep, yeah, go on. What, what inspires you? Oh, that is a good question. Someone else want to... Anyone else? Go on, what inspires you, Darren? Let's put it back on you, seeing as you asked the question. No, I'll tell you, I'll, let's put it across to Nick, first of all. <laughs> Right, did you mean being inspired generally? Yeah, what, 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 you know, what, what, yeah, just you wake up in the morning, what inspires you? Who inspires you? What inspires you? Um, obviously I'm really inspired by the landscape that I'm surrounded by, I mean, obviously. But what I think really inspires me more than anything is good people. And people who, are, who do stuff for other people. And there are a lot of them around here. Mm. And they're usually quite brilliant people too in whatever sort of thing they do. But just people who've got time for others. Yeah. And that really inspires me because it makes me think I should try and be a little bit of a better person, you know. Do you think you've become a better person as you've got older? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. When I was 18, I was an arsehole. Yeah. A complete prick. I I'll, really was. I'll agree with that. You know, I was an absolute more Me, I'm talking about, not you. I, I didn't know you. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I just need to clarify that, yeah. I agree yeah. with that as no, well. I think I'm, a, I'm yeah. a far better person now than I was at 18. I was a horrible person at 18. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think most of us, I think it's just that age. You know? I mean, Helen said to me the other night, she said, you have really mellowed, like, you know, even in the last kind of few years, you know, your outlook on life now is totally different to, to, to what I was you know when I was kind of 18 or in my, even in my 20s there's um you know I won't I won't go into kind of too many details but there's a a lady let's just say a lot of people kind of know and a lot of people kind of like take the take take the mickey out of her um and I've got so much like empathy for, for this woman I've kind of got to know her a little bit and she told me a little bit about her life you know and I just think I kind of almost understand the way you are you, you, because of I'm not I know I'm not explaining this and I don't want to say too much but there's little snippets of her life that I know and I think I, I know why you're like this but I think when I was in my twenties I would have perhaps judged her the same as a lot of other people judge her so I like to think you know as I've got older I've got more more to the left. Than I was. I was very much like more right wing in my in my political views when I was younger. Now I'm I'm getting further to the left every, every year. Um, yeah, I've got a lot more empathy for people. I, I think I'm a lot of a, I'm more of a kinder person now than I was uh, 20 years ago. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, I am too. And I know I've got a reputation for being grumpy and prickly. A lot of that's just an act. But I'm like you, I'm dead mellow. Yeah. Dead mellow because, you know, we've had our best years now, haven't we? Yeah. Speak for yourself. I'm, <laughs> I'm all right. I know with that bloody syrup you're wearing. <laughs> you're only jealous. He takes that off. I am. I can't that afford off. one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but, but I think for me, you know, 
I think you know, for, for all of us really I mean we're all into landscape photography in one form or another but I think now for me it is just being outside well it's always been outside I've always enjoyed being outside but I think the older that I get the more and more I just want to be outside yeah you know I really do you know a lot of that is down to and a lot of that is down to the landscape photography as well you know it started off but we what we were touching on earlier you know you go out originally perhaps to take a photo and you get quite invested in 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 the photography but for now if i don't come home with a photo that is or if i do come home with a photo that's the icing on the cake for me now this being on the top of a fell being on top of a mountain especially in a tent an overnighter oh, that feeling, you know, that feeling of being a bit chilly and then waking up in the morning, making that first yeah. cup of tea, you know. Oh, yeah. That's a really healthy viewpoint. And do you remember when you and I went up Shabbat? Of course I do. You almost killed me. <laughs> Did I? Jesus, well, bad, was it? man, not many. <laughs> I come back and I said to the boys, I said, mate, if you ever go out with Nick, I said, if he ever offers you to go out, I said, don't go out of him. <laughs> Seriously, I reckon he was trying to, he was trying to kill the Londoner. I reckon that's what he was trying to knock the London out of me that night. Don't mess about, you get sick. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. you know, we didn't take any photos, did no. we? But we had a great chat. We, we did. enjoyed the walk. We did, yeah. Came down in the dark, didn't we? We did come down in the dark, yeah. And there's one thing I said, and I don't know if I said it on the podcast, but I know I definitely said it to these guys. And, uh, uh, and I'm not saying it just because you're here, but I said, you know, that we, we, we came down in the dark and I felt so confident in your ability to kind of lead us down you knew every rock i remember you saying right in a minute we're going to hop over a boulder that's going to rock a little bit you know just be careful on that and then we got to that bit you said right we need to slide down on our, on our backsides here and then and then when we get to this point don't look over that edge or don't go near that i felt so comfortable in your company knowing that you were going to get us down you know in in the dark so kudos. Well, it's me, it's me job, isn't it? Yeah, but so kudos <laughs> to you, mate. Li literally, <laughs> literally, you just said to me, that rock's going to wobble a bit, and I'd be like, I'm, I'm staying up here. <laughs> <laughs> straight on the straight on the GPS, yeah. yeah. Mountain Rescue, yeah. I'm on a wobbly rock. Yeah. There's no chance. Yeah, hang on a minute, Gary. You're assuming you'd have got up there in the first place. That's, that's yeah. a very good point. Yeah. No, I'm talking yeah. about wobbly rock down at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. yeah there's a slight wobble on this rock as you go up i'm all right i think i'll take a picture of the lake yeah, i appreciate no, it was, there's not it, a lake on motion it, but I don't know it that. was very ah, there is there is oh god no, there's, really there's several <laughs> but do you remember several, Gary. do you remember nick as we got closer because the weather conditions was looking really good yeah and i think about 50 meters from the top it started to clag up, didn't it? It happens a lot yeah. on that hill. I don't know what it is. You get within 10 minutes of the summit and it just clags, it clags yeah. in. Yeah. I remember sitting kind of behind that kind of that stone wall up there, you know, kind of putting on layers and stuff because it yeah. got really chilly. And then we went on to the northeast ridge and tried to take some shots and yeah. it wasn't happy. It was very cold, as I remember yeah, it. Yeah, it just, it just didn't happen for us. But, it, but yeah, it was, it was a great day. And I'm, yeah. and I'm joking about you. I've killed me. I mean, you did, but it was it was a it was a yeah it was a fantastic afternoon stroke evening. We'd definitely do it again. Definitely, all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So come on, gal. What inspires you? I think I think what inspires me is just being creative and learning new things. I think that's what inspires me. Just, just, I, I get real pleasure out. I mean, over the years, I've sort of, I've always had hobbies and I've always had, I've always kind of taught myself different things. And I think learning that and becoming proficient as something that you taught yourself, it kind of inspires me, really. And it's just yeah. that I have a kind of, I wouldn't say it's a thirst for knowledge, but I do, I do enjoy doing stuff. And it's usually around the creative sort of, you know, hobbies. So, you know, I used to, I did this, there's this, there's this program called Cinema 4D, which is like a 3D uh, design program where you can build stuff. And I, I it's, it's quite a steep learning curve and I taught myself how to build stuff. And then I was modeling my room and making, you know, l sort of photo realistic images of like all my stuff. And it's, it's just that sort of thing and designing golf courses in computer games and that just, just that sort of being creative really. And a, a bit mm. like, like nick as well helping people 
you know going back to sort of what we were talking about earlier about me watching all these these videos and i just thought to myself if i come back to do vlogging i want it to be more than just me going out and doing a vlog i want to help people or i want to i don't want to help people i want to build a community where everyone helps each other mm. you know so i'm thinking like something along the lines of for instance i'd love to have a Flickr group where everyone puts images on that are free to download so if you want to share your images with other people they can just have it they can just they can just you know you can go oh i'm offering this out for free to someone else for them to download to use for whatever purpose and, and see I, I think you'd be really good at that gal i really do because i think you know the reason why you stopped vlogging and and some of your uh irritations should we say um is is people kind of being too focused on themselves you know yeah so I, I think you know if you come back in that kind of vein i think you'd get a lot out of it and i think other people would as well yeah i think you should do it well i'm thinking of releasing a video sometime just after valentine's day um because Ooh. jamie had a bet with me that i wouldn't release anything or I'll be releasing I, something I, by I, Valentine's I Day. That. So but just after Valentine's Day, where I'm going to say to people, look, I want ideas and I want people to, you know, offer up suggestions of how I can do something that's going to be like a, a whole community thing. So more than just me putting out a video and going, oh, you know, follow me on this and buy this and do this and do that. Let's all be a group. Let's all be a community. Let's all find something that we can offer each other. You know, and I can almost like host that and and sort of like be the, the focal point for everyone doing nice things for everyone else. I don't know what or how, I've got no idea, but that's kind of where I want to get to. And that sort of thing inspires me massively, much more than having 700 people like my video, you know. But Nick, when you when you go out, you know, kind of uh, and, and, you, and you take people kind of up to the mountains... I mean, that must feel quite nice, I suppose, in some of these people. Do you ever get people that are, um, you know, a little bit nervous, you know, about going up and, you know, but that must be nice if you get them part of the way, all the way, you know, and they feel that they've achieved something? There's a hell of a lot of psychology involved in guiding in the hills. And the most important things are not that you can navigate and keep people safe because that's a given. You shouldn't have the qualification if you can't. But for the first half an hour of the walk, I'm watching people and watching how they how they move. So, because I don't want to nanny people. I don't want to say, put your foot there, do this, do that. If they need it, then I'll help them in that way. But I'm also trying to work out their psychological makeup. Yeah. And if they do start to get a bit fretful, I need to know which tool from my box to employ. Yeah. Some people like carrot, others need stick. But um, I do a lot of my work on Snowden, and people say, oh, it must be really boring for you. But it's not at all, because I get to, I get to see people that will climb the only mountain they'll ever climb in their lives. Yeah. And they get so much out of it. Exactly. And yeah. I chat to them throughout the day. I hear their stories. I encourage them. I help them when the chips are down. And at the end of the day, they can't thank me enough. Yeah. I've had a really nice walk with lovely people. And seeing that sense of achievement on them on their face because they're huffing and puffing and they really don't think they can do it. But if you're able bodied, you can do it. Yeah. You just need to I see myself as a, an enabler. Yeah. And yeah, it's really, really, really rewarding. It must be. And I'm in, and I'm inspired also by seeing those people feel the fear and feel um real physical discomfort and go through it. Push yeah. past it. Yeah. And that's really inspiring. Because I take that home and I think, well, I'm feeling a bit crap today, but come on, you can do it. Hang on, sorry, What's people go through that today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's called the they wall do. gal. Have you have you not heard of that? Yeah, I get I hit I hit every morning. I get out of bed. Then I usually just go back to bed. <laughs> sorry. What about you, Dave? What what, what inspires you, mate? This is going to sound really trite and almost embarrassing what inspires me is my dad my oh, dad used lovely. to climb some really difficult routes back in the late 50s early 60s and i said to him once why did you stop climbing and he said because 
I got married and had kids and there came a point when it it was part of the deal. You don't risk your life when you've got a family to bring up. And I knew, and it wasn't a case of I knew, he told me that that was a tough decision. He wasn't a walker. He, he's not that interested in summits and ridges. Well, to be fair, later in life, he loved walking ridges, but nevertheless, he was a climber. So there's a couple of routes on the Idwell slabs where he was one of the first people to make that route. And over the years, when I was a youngster, I was a complete waste of time. I was an utter waste of space. He must have despaired. He got this son who's a complete imbecile. But as I got older and more mature and understood how life works, and he said to me, you know, oh, that, that route there, that was me. I remember once when he was, he was getting on a bit and he was a bit too old to do any serious walks. We were on the train up Snowden and he pointed over to Cloggy, which Nick will know. And he says, one day we camped down in the bottom by the lake and we were up and down on ropes all day long. And it, it just put it into context for me. And as gormless as it may sound, and I, I make no apologies for it, even up to my very last walk, most recent walk, I went up to uh, top end of Comorth and up onto the top there uh, to take a particular image and Nick stood me up. And even that walk, I was thinking, oh, dad will enjoy this. Uh, I'll send, you know, so I've, I've taken a load of images. I haven't shared them on social media. They'll come out shortly-ish if I ever get around to editing the video. But I've, I've we transferred them to my dad so he can have them on his little gallery because he's well into his 80s. He's quite infirm. And I know that when I share, oh, I was up here, I did this, here's a couple of images. And I know he, he'll get something out of that. And it's almost at the moment, almost every image I take in the hills is, is this one that dad will enjoy? Because he's now living vicariously through what I get up to. Yeah. And if he wasn't such an inspiration, I would be getting up to it. And so my inspiration is my dad. You know, this is a guy who, he was camping up on, as an example, and I'm going to use this and because some people will understand, he pitched a tent up on the top of the glitters with his mates back in the late 50s from the Stockport Climbing Club. And they had a bothy over in Kravnant. He used to walk over to Kappel for a pint and then walk back to Kravnant to the bothy. But they'd pitch a tent up on the glitters and they'd walk all the way to Bethesda, get absolutely bladdered, walk all the way back up Nan Francon, back up to the glitters to their tents. And I remember driving along there one day with him in the truck and he said, oh, yeah, we used to walk down here. What do you mean walk? Oh, come on. No, we, we pitch our tents and walk down to Bethesda for a beer. It's out. It's insane. The sort of distances they, they went for alcohol. They were an incredible generation. Oh, they weren't really they were. just? And that's my inspiration. I, I take pictures, I walk the same routes. I can't climb the climbs he did because I'm too much of a... But, <laughs> you know, hats off to them. And these were guys long before the days of Gore-Tex. I'm going off on a, on a bit of a tangent and Gary's thinking, thank goodness for that. But Because <laughs> he's got to read it some of that. Uh, but no, it was during the, the early carp fishermen, you know, like the carp fishermen of today, you, you, you know, you you got your bivvy, you got your bite alarms, your comfortable bed chair, all that kind of stuff. You know, the pioneers of carp fishing kind of 30 years ago, there was nothing like that, you know. So these guys were, most most carp kind of come of a night, so they would be sitting up like all night, you know, kind of waiting and ready, you know, with, with all the heavy gear or none of the lightweight gear. And it goes back to what you were saying, you know, back in the day, you know, kind of 
the mountaineers and the hikers, you know, to think that the you know, just even the clothes that they used to wear, the big heavy clothes, and when they when they used to get wet, crikey, I bet that weighed an absolute ton on their backs, you know. Are you talking so, about Richard Walker at Red Mile Pool with a fifty-two pound carp? That, exactly. You look at all the, the all yeah. the, all of these guys, you know, um, that, that that used to do it. So, so thanks yeah. for tuning in to the fishing podcast. Yeah, the, the fishing. We'll be channel. back next week with some perch. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what you're talking about. So, have you, have you had um? I do. Nick, what well, sports your scary? Have you missed had a scary moment up on the mountains, whether it be Snowdonia or somewhere else? You must have had a, a moment where you've got a little bit twitchy. Too many to mention. Really, and they're still happening now. Yeah. You know, when I see clients sketching about on Bristly Ridge and I'm pooing my pants thinking, shit, if she comes off. Really? Yeah, but I've had, um, I c there's a lot of people these days, they get into climbing and walking through um, courses. You know, and I can't knock it because they're the sort of things that I provide. But I came from um, a mountaineering club background, whereas you go out with your mates and you learn on the job and you have epics mm -hmm. and it goes tits up. And you learn to get yourself out of them. So, yeah, I've had some very scary times. Yeah. One of the scariest times. I mean, you get all these people. They're taking photos of Bucoletted Moor. I've been airlifted off the thing. Mm. Oh, have you? Yeah, I have, yeah. Yeah, I had a big epic on there about 15 years ago. And um, we tried to get ourselves out of it. You know, minutes turned into hours. And it all went really tits up. And um, the old Sea King helicopter came to get us and winched me off North Buttress. No, it wasn't North Buttress, it was D Gully Buttress, right on the front face of Buckleted Moor. So, you know, that's the quickest I've ever got down off a hill. It was fantastic. <laughs> you know, hanging off a winch with 2,000 foot of air beneath you wow. was quite, quite something. I bet it was. I bet that, I bet that experience, though, has helped you today. Hasn't it? You know, it, although it was a bad experience at the time, it's helped you now because you probably realise the trouble you can get yourself into if you're not careful. Definitely. And we were very, very confident at the time and we just read the guidebook wrong and got on the wrong route, really. Mm. But the next, the week after that, we were back in Snowdonia and we did the whole Idwell back wall. So we did a route on the slabs. We did Holly Tree Wall, Continuation Wall and Seniors Ridge just to try and get back on the horse again. And it... it I think it was 13 hours of just sheer terror. <laughs> yeah. So it's not it's not always pleasant, but we call that type two fun, you know, where the pleasure's purely retrospective. I got a story very similar to that, actually. About two years ago, I had... No, shut up, I do. About two years ago... I not remotely K similar. No, about two yeah. years ago, I had a KFC, <laughs> and I had such bad indigestion. This is a true story. <laughs> I had such bad indigestion, I thought I was having a heart attack. And I got my, I got my wife to drive me to A&E because I genuinely thought I was having a heart attack. I did an ECG and went, no, you're fine. Realised it was indigestion. And I made myself have a KFC two or three days later because I thought if I don't, I'm never going to get to enjoy that again. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Epic. Yeah, epic. an epic story, like similar to yours. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's a true story, actually. That is true yeah, story. don't tell me. Prince William winched you down into the car park. <laughs> and on that note, I think we'll call it a day. Um, I want to say massive thank you for Nick to come to Nick for coming on. Yeah, it's been brilliant. And listen, Nick, you you must come back as well. I'd love oh, to. Definitely. I really would. Yeah. Brilliant. We'll, I want to. I'll tell you what we'll do. Right, we'll add you to our list of Roster. list of regulars. List of. Yeah, regulars. So you'll come oh. on and then we'll have Lynn on sometimes and we'll have Owen on. And you can The way on. things are going, you'll be on every other week. Yeah. <laughs> and can I just well, say well, that, that I was a bit, I must admit, I was a bit disappointed early on that Nick didn't give us too much of his life story. So if you're not familiar with Nick, please check out his channel. Yeah, no, his, his stories are absolutely incredible. They really are. I think he was being a little bit modest tonight, and he yeah, a bit all about. Himself. And speaking Please, of somebody yeah. who, speaking of somebody who kind of knows Snowdonia a little bit, his book is by a country mile. Absolutely, the best. Yeah, without doubt, the best photographers, 
Walker's book. Just buy it. You won't totally be disappointed. Agree. I have to say about your book as well, Nick. I have to say this. I remember meeting you for the very first time with Dave in Cafe Shabod, right? And yes. I bought your book and you said, do you want me to sign it? And I went, no, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to bring it with me next time we're out and you can sign it for me, all right? I'm well, I'll tell you what I will do. After that, I'll, I'll wipe my ass on it. <laughs> <laughs> That'll triple the value straight away. And, and, and again, not, not blowing smoke just because Nick's here, but I remember standing in the cafe looking at the gallery that you had there, Nick. I don't oh. know if you've still got it there, but that gallery, and I just stood there just thinking, Jesus Mate, these are incredible photos. So, yeah, I, I, we, yeah. if you come back on, Nick, you're going to have to tell us a lot more about your story. OK, I will, but thank right. you. You're very, very kind, all of you. I will say as well that we will put a link to your YouTube channel below because you are not standard fodder YouTuber. Your stuff is much better than that. You And you, you kind of tell little stories. They're like I feel like they're little vignettes. Your videos, they're not just like, oh, here I am out on the mountain, let's talk about it. They're kind of little stories, and, and I really enjoy that about you. So we'll put that link down. And if you don't watch Nick, then please just go and subscribe, because his, his, yep. A, his photography is brilliant, and B, his YouTube channel is also very, very good. Yeah, so, shut look. up. You're making me look <laughs> average now. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. getting really uncomfortable now. Yeah. Oh, they're ju he's just taking the piss out of me. He's yeah. making me look bad. I'd say he's the best photographer and youtuber in the whole of the snowdonia and anglesey area you oh, best <laughs> in fact i think nick's the only photographer yeah. and, and a right in, that's in it fact, i'd off. say his first second and third best <laughs> <laughs> come okay. back here where's he gone what a prima donna oh, <laughs> unbelievable. there we go yeah let's say goodbye now yeah so with that I think we'll all say goodbye. Are you back, Dave? Yeah, good to see you back. With that, we'll say <laughs> goodbye and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. See you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.